Okay. Um, I guess we can get started. So, um, good afternoon. Hope you all had a great lunch. Um, I think we're now in the unofficial Vulcan for Science block of the conference with three talks on that topic, and I'm happy to be part of it, and I'll go first. So, hopefully, if you are a researcher, an educator, or engineer to consider switching to Vulcan for Compute, this talk will give you some ideas, share some experiences, and summarizes some of the cool things about Vulcan's current support for Compute. A uh, little bit about me before we go into this. Um, I did my PhD from 2014 to 2018 in Graz, Austria. Um, then I had a brief internship at Epic Games, where I was witness to the development of Nanite. Um, then did a postdoc at the TU Wien, together with Johannes Unterguckenberger. And now doing some research at INRIA, Université Côte d'Azur in Nice. And also still going on doing some teaching of GP, GPU programming with OpenGL, CUDA, and Vulkan for the past few years at different universities. So, in short, I am focused on GPU compute, uh, which is also reflected in the research which we did on compute style rendering, first of triangle meshes, and then more recently of point clouds. Um, and as many researchers, I have a bit of an NVIDIA bias as I work mostly with their GPUs. So please keep that in mind if I don't mention AMD features that you are particularly fond of. Okay, so let's make a quick point for Vulkan via compute, starting with the challenges of learning it. Uh, we know that without any garnish, the Vulkan C API can be quite verbose. Um, here are a few comments on different Draw My First Triangle Vulcan tutorials that I scraped from around the internet. And I personally think that if Vulcan wants to extend its reach to the masses who have little or prior experience with GPU programming, it would be great to curb the learning curve somehow. And uh, there are a lot of great approaches out there already, including the abstractions and frameworks that uh, are provided by Johannes Unterguckenberger from yesterday's tutorial, so shout out to that. Um, but since I have a compute background, I thought maybe there's a way to achieve this without the need for abstractions by approaching Balkan via compute. And this is why it earns the top spots on my personal list for making Balkan more approachable and more easily approachable. Um, and you may be thinking, but the GPU is for graphics and I want to do graphics on it. And I agree to a point, but it is also clear that compute shaders have um, an incredibly broad reach already and an incredible wide field of applications like physics simulations, but also for real-time and offline software rendering. So there are several use cases where you can actually apply your compute knowledge to graphics, very tangible use cases, and I will hope to make uh, a few points on that. The second point for simplifying Vulkan without compromise, again, on my personal list, is uh, embracing the C++-style wrapper Vulkan HPP for the Vulkan C API. And in my opinion, this really doesn't abstract anything conceptually. It takes repetitive behavior that the same way when you switch from C to C++ and suddenly you don't have to uh, free your memory anymore because there is the availability of smart portals and tools that we just use every day when we program with C++ and they just become second nature to you. The third point I want to make is to exploit tooling. Um, we saw already in the, uh, especially today, a great demonstration of the available Vulkan tools that are being developed and are still in the process of being improved the whole time. Um, and the last point is quite trivial, but relevant, um, is my advice to stay up to date with Vulkan developments, which are very quick. For instance, if you want to simplify your code base, you can always benefit from latest applications of features that are being adapted into uh, core, for instance, as recently was done for the um, application or the ability to actually print F from your shaders without needing to load any kind of other compatibility or extensions. So maybe also as a quick shout out to the people who followed along with yesterday's tutorial for graphics. This is what the hello world of compute looks like. Uh, if you don't know, Vulkan has a printf. So this straightforward hello world for Vulkan 
It just prints this standard message, but multiple times, once from each GPU thread that you invoked. And notice this, uh, this even contains, let me see if I can bring up the pointer. Note that this even contains the shader code for good measure. So it's all pretty much self-contained within that one file. And to address the concept of verbosity, you could literally print that out on a business card. It would be a pretty bad business card, but you could. <laughs> uh, this is the output that you uh, generate. Sorry, let me quickly set that up. So this is the output that you generate, pretty much what you would expect. And to circle back the individual stages of it, just a few lines of Falcon setup some shader setup for your pipeline, and then the final dispatch. Pretty much all there in that application. And um, sorry, going back to that. And if you use Vulkan HPP in debug mode, this is even somewhat properly error checked, right? Because Vulkan HPP um, basically wraps your functions, checks the return values in debug mode. And as we saw earlier today, if you need validation, if you use VK config, in the background that basically replaces loading your desired validation layers in shader in the application's code, right? So that again simplifies the whole setup and you basically get the entire benefit of what you would otherwise have to do with several additional lines of code just by exploiting the tooling you have, making it arguably more convenient and more practical. So, with that impression, I tried to give this idea uh, a bigger shot. And after the recent papers about teaching Balkan for graphics, again authored by Johannes Unterkuggenberger, I tried to see if we could get a compute-based Balkan for compute undergrad course going, um, which basically doesn't need to abstract anything. We just use what's in the Lunar G SDK and then additionally render doc. And the setting for this course was a 40 hour, roughly 40 hour lecture with 11 students, which had virtually no low level GPU experience prior to that. And we gave them a suit of 12 hands on coding tasks where they pretty much had to start from zero. So all of the Vulkan features, all of the Vulkan specific code was written by them. Um, they were supported by Vulkan HPP to reduce robustity. They got to use VK config and render doc and instructions how to use them. And all remaining coding steps were written by them. Uh, with a focus on making the tasks short, at most 30 minutes each, um, if you know the background sufficiently, all with tangible results. Um, I want to continue onward with this at some point, maybe turning it also into a tutorial similar to what Johannes did yesterday. At the moment, I'm missing, I'm lacking a curated recording where all the necessary background is also mentioned. So for right now, I only have the tasks available and I'll see in which form I will uh, publish them, but I plan to do it over the course of the next year. Okay, so here's the list of tasks, um, which is subject to change following the feedback from the students. And um, you might wonder, for instance, how can we produce tangible results for something like copying? And the way I did it here is I, for instance, gave them some buffers with seemingly randomized numbers and then gave them instructions, copy part of this buffer to this location, then take another buffer, copy it to this location, then take a third buffer, copy it partly over the other two, and so on and so on, all with different targets and offsets. And if the students do it in the right order and they also don't fail to synchronize properly between the different instructions, they get a set of numbers that if summed up and then printed in hex, reveal the secret message of the day, right? So kind of in the advent of code style to give them something that they see, oh, I did it right. Um, and so if you get a, a pipeline barrier somewhere in between, obviously you get something different that gives you garbage and uh, I also encourage students to do that basically to try and break stuff, which makes it important that the tasks are short, right? If you have hundreds of lines of code to get your task going, you probably lack the energy or the time to fiddle with each individual line of code and see if your application still works. If it's something that is short, you can take the time and really poke at and prod at individual features and see at which point things start to break down to get a feeling for when um, basically some synchronization is redundant or some synchronization is really needed that you put in there. 
Um, here are also some visual examples of what you can do with compute. Of course, basic application that you can do is you run an edge detector on an image, image in, edge detected out, write that to disk, you already have a visual result, right? Nice, short, and tangible. Um, and also something that is more related to research is basically a lightweight version of a software-based point cloud renderer based on the research I did with uh, Markus Schütz. And this is interesting because it's not just a nice visual application, it's also something that when implemented gives you actually something with state-of-the-art performance by exploiting rendering via compute shaders. So, but most of you are beyond that stage. So for you, a more relevant question would be, why should I use Vulkan for compute? Or maybe you have an experience with other APIs uh, that are purely compute and you are wary of the transition. And in that case, the following section is meant for you. And here's a quick summary of my arguments. In short, I'll try to quickly make a, po uh, a point about the following. So first of all, sorry, I don't know why this appears as one. But OK, let's go for it. Um, so the first argument is quite self-explanatory, is to reduce bloat. If you have the dependency on Vulkan and something else like CUDA, and then maybe also DirectX for good measure, you have quite some bloat in your application. If you have the ability to do it all with one API, which technically you have with Vulkan, then why not directly go for that? Uh, Vulkan has some outstanding portability without sacrificing important features because the base profile basically you can write pretty much os agnostic and vendor agnostic code but if you do want to use the advanced features you in most cases have the ability to bring them in easily for instance uh, in the use of glsl shading with extensions that are being loaded in or for instance with the nv api um, and the third point i would like to make is that you have actually a quite big freedom to design your own workflow with Volcom, which is also something that we will see an example of in a few slides. And the last question you might be wondering is, OK, so if I have all these amenities, what is the difficulty level of transitioning from a pure GPGPU API that I'm used to to Volcom for compute? And even with those features, uh, in addition to that, it might still be easier than you think because there have been people that have asked the same question and also already tried to make this way easier and make this transition easier for you. So first of all, to the argument of portability. Um, since Vulkan aims to be portable, if you need some cutting edge feature or vendor specific behavior, then you have to load it in via extensions. And if you are afraid that by changing to Vulkan, you're losing some specific capabilities that seem exclusive to other APIs just by intuition. The answer is usually no, there's an extension for most of them. So um, this is obvious to anybody who's been working with these kinds of devices for a long time. To the novices, it might not be so, but underneath, it's the same hardware and whether or not you can use a particular feature is mostly a question of whether or not it is exposed to you which is exactly what the extensions are for. So here are some examples of extensions that are available. So for instance, you might need atomic floating point arithmetic. You might think perhaps this is a CUDA exclusive feature. Of course it's not. You can load in the proper extensions for that. Um, you need some release or acquire atomics, which also seem like something that might only be Turing exclusive. Again, there's an extension for that. And you might want to use the tensor course yeah, sure, for that as well. Um, just a quick side note for the last one. I did not uh, profile and confirm that it is actually physically using the Tensor Course, but I think it's pretty clear that this is basically the interface for using this. So Tensor Course are never explicitly mentioned in the extension specification, but I think it's pretty obvious. Good. So beyond the features, you might have particular requirements for your coding language, and you might be wary of sacrificing some convenient features. And the good news there is that you have a broad range of options to choose from, as long as you have some way of turning it into Spiri. So you can write in GLSL, you can write in Rust or Metal. And uh, if that is not enough, as we heard from the guys from Nabla yesterday, there are people out there making the ecosystem even more versatile by creating languages that are derivatives of uh, other 
prior efforts with C++ 14 like behavior, which is just great. So just a quick side by side comparison of the same shader doing the same behavior or getting the same behavior two different languages. And one more with uh, HLSL slash slang on the left hand and GLSL on the right side. Um, just to keep this in mind quickly, this is a shader that basically um, in a non-sequential manner computes the nth Fibonacci number, um, which we will come back to shortly. So just as an, ex an example now, but keep that particular shader and what it does in mind. We will come back to this in a minute. So even with these amenities available for you, you might still have a very strong opinion about the Vulkan API itself and just can't get to grips with how it's laid out. And the good news there is, again, you don't need to do that if you really don't want to. You basically do Vulkan without Vulkan, right? So if you need the portability, but don't want to get to grips with the API, there's already solutions out there for you, such as libc, which basically gives you Vulkan compute with a C++ style interface. There's Vulkan compute with a K, so a very nice Vulkan compute framework for advanced GPU processing based around tensors. And then there's VUDA, which basically provides a CUDA runtime API interface where you can directly pretty much reuse your CUDA code, just include a different header, and then suddenly it will compile without the use of the NVCC. So on the left-hand side, we have some example of libvc, where we see, okay, you can even still reduce the number of lines that you need to get some compute program going quite significantly with the use of, for instance, this library, um, where by line seven or so, we already have all our basic uh, setups going on with the, in uh, with the instance, some buffers, a program, and a command buffer even. And on the right-hand side, we basically see how interchangeable the use of VUDA makes your CUDA code with something that compiles with NVCC, with something that you can compile with any other uh, compiler as well. Okay, so this seems like it's a great argument for using Vulkan for everything that is compute related, but unfortunately in life, it's never just all roses. And of course, I want to be transparent here and point out some of the remaining issues that you might encounter when you commit to using Vulkan for compute, okay? So we know that uh, General purpose compute shaders, they can quickly become quite complex and often for compute it is key when you do design some compute solution and some compute project that you can maintain performance and ensure performance. So luckily we actually have a great so, uh, range of solutions for debugging and also profiling the shaders that we write. We get tools from the respective vendors, for instance, NSAID graphics and RGP but limitations do apply. So for example, in NSAID graphics, right now it does not by default expose the uh, machine code instructions that you get, which is something that you might be very used to when you do CUDA profiling and might rely on when you do CUDA profiling. Um, so in order to get that behavior, some professional addition and some agreements with the company is needed. And uh, we saw a great intro to render docs debugging capabilities earlier today, which is just a fantastic uh, tool to use. And it's perfect for fixing arithmetic logic and data alignment errors also in your compute shaders, but it is not yet fully equivalent to the debuggers that you have, for instance, for Rockem and CUDA. Um, so immediately after the talk, we got the question whether it is possible to debug behavior that is somehow collaborative in nature. So for instance, if we circle back to the Fibonacci compute shader that we had before, uh, I'm running this here in RenderDoc, and basically now I'm doing it collaboratively. Each thread computes one Fibonacci number, then they all exchange them via shared memory and thread zero prints them all out, right? So I see the correct sequence of Fibonacci numbers printed by thread zero, but then, of course, since I use shared memory, if I actually go ahead and debug the program and step through it step by step, uh, changing to the GLSL code, I hope you can see that somewhat properly. If not, I will just basically indicate to you what is visually happening. Um, as we step through the iterations of the loop, we see that the variable that we get from shared memory 
actually does not represent what we put in there from inside the other threads, which is totally clear because what RenderDoc is doing here is simulating a single thread. Um, however, for compute shaders and also mesh shaders to mention, uh, collaboration, especially via shared memory, is quite vital. So at this point, debugging um, is not in a, in a portable way currently possible. There are some efforts towards it, maybe for even really simulating it on the GPU. But right now, this remains an open challenge. Um, and let's quickly circle back again to the available features in Vulkan. So overall, uh, a great feature of Vulkan, which is pretty unique, is that it has a well-defined C++ 11 style memory consistency model. But unfortunately, it does not provide a straightforward progress guarantee, which for compute applications negates um, several interesting use cases of a globally consistent memory model. So, however, in practice, actually, as uh, referenced by the experiments that I linked here, actually many compute uh, GPUs still seem to fulfill that forward progress guarantee. It's just that it is not part of the specification. So if you ever need to rely on it, you might be dependent on actually ensuring that you can run your app on specific hardware. Um, another part is that Vulkan supports a wide range of features, and you can get cutting-edge and vendor-specific features with some extensions, but some popular ones are missing. For instance, if you rely on things like dynamic parallelism in CUDA, um, as far as I'm aware, there's no way to get that behavior currently in a vulkan based application. Um, and in a second, we will hear about a great effort by uh, the next presenter who developed a actual library is called VKFFT for use with Vulkan. So the ability to do fast Fourier transforms with Vulkan code. And uh, this is great news, but other APIs are at the point where they offer a wide range of libraries for all kinds of things that you need to do, which as a researcher is especially interesting because when you prototype some experience, uh, experiments, often you want to grab some behavior like sorting or uh, prefix sums or putting things into containers and moving them around rather quickly. And for that, the ecosystem is not yet there. But again, this is a great opportunity for you as parts of the community to make a name for yourself and contribute to it and maybe be the first to make a thrust or a cup equivalent for Vulkan that is then just portable, which would be amazing. Okay, uh, another point is the documentation. Uh, in, in my opinion, Vulkan is in the odd situation where one could say that there's perhaps too much documentation. Um, so to get something from it, readers must be used to going through hundreds of pages and picking out the tidbit of information that they need. Uh, the first point, I don't know if this is just me, but whenever I try and I frequently do it, uh, bring it up in a browser, uh, there's a significant delay for me until I can use it. So. I don't know if anybody else experiences this. Um, in the documentation, it's comparably fresh to other APIs. Mistakes do happen, but as far as I can tell, they are being fixed wherever they exist post haste. And right now, um, most of them have been squashed or very, very few of them remain. Um, and some statements can be technically correct, but the wording might be a little unintuitive in such a large document, which just happens. But you can always contribute to that change, and you can always help improve it. Uh, here's my personal sob story, basically, where I went through the documentation and just couldn't make heads of tail of some specific uh, paragraph relating to the moving of data between the host and the device. Uh, and I basically went on the uh, Vulkan docs uh, GitHub, made a suggestion for an improvement, and after some back and forth, Everybody agreed, and this is now part of the documentation, which is great, right? Uh, so that's a very impressive reaction from the community, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, and lastly, I note on the remaining difficulties of teaching Vulkan for compute. So one inherently tough topic is synchronization, partly because it's tough to analyze hands-on. And what I mean by that is your GPU, in many cases, might actually do things strictly in order when, according to the specification, it's free to jumble things around. So it can be quite difficult to 
actually leave out or verify that you have done something incomplete uh, or have some instructions missing because your GPU might just glance over it and not alert you and not expose the behavior that you would expect. Scheduling is usually kind of tricky to nail down because there's always some factor of randomization or architecture specifics in there. Um, so maybe one option would be to take the subject of synchronization and somehow gamify it, um, where perhaps you get some tasks and you need to put synchronizations in the right places. You get some score if you've done it correctly and maybe some alert if you did it overly uh, in an overly slow way and it might give you a hint that there might be a better way to do this, but this is just a hot take uh, on the side. Um, the scripto sets, uh, one part that I've heard discussed by people who learn and to teach, um, as it was initially conceived, it seems when you try to teach it, there's just one too many steps in the whole process to get your resources to be visible to the shader for the novice learner. Like at some point when you explain the process and the individual structs that you need to fill, uh, their eyes might just glaze over and you need to start from the beginning a couple of times until they have all the steps nailed down and they all make sense to them. But again, the community is quick to react, which again is amazing. We now have the uh, extension for DVK descriptor buffer, which should simplify this process of handling descriptor sets. So as I bring it up again, already there appears to be a viable solution to it. So it's not really that much of an issue. Um, and finally, curbing the mental load as a final takeaway message. Um, if you are in a position to suggest courses or learning agendas, I think that Vulkan Gaia Compute provides overall a gentler learning curve for mastering a modern GPU API. So if you are in that rare position, um, I might suggest that you give that a shot. And this brings me to the end. And I don't think this talk was likely to raise a lot of questions. But if you have them, since I went over time a little in the interest of time, I guess find me after the session. And yeah, thanks for attending.